was Last Train to Clarksville, a song that was released in August of 1966, a few weeks before the Monkees TV show debuted, and it already sold several hundred thousand copies when the Monkees TV show hit the airwaves of NBC. I'm the Amazing Mystery DJ Han. Our guest in the studio is Eric Lefkowitz. You may have read his article on the Monkees in the May 4th issue of BAM magazine. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Tell us about the monkeys. Oh, about the monkeys? I guess they're just about the greatest uh, prefabricated group that's uh, ever come along. Um, the fact that they were manufactured and got together and somehow managed to turn out all right is probably uh, one of the great scoops of all time in rock history. And uh, that's what's pretty much attracted me to the group in the first place, to write about them. And tonight we'll be playing interviews with... Uh three members of the Monkees, the exception being Mike Nesmith. Yes, uh, Nesmith uh, refused to be interviewed. I guess he's uh, involved in more intellectual projects now, such as rock videos. Yeah, I believe he might have another show on NBC soon. Uh, He's working on a TV special called Elephant Parts. Yes, uh, Michael Nesmith and Television Parts. And uh, yes, I guess that's uh, based on a a rock video he had won a Grammy for. Didn't he win the first Grammy for a rock video? uh, recording artist to uh, win a video and Grammy. Of, of course, I think the reason that there's been a resurgence of interest in the monkeys is that lately, rock videos, of course, have become very popular, and most people associate the monkeys with the first uh, experience they had seeing rock and video combined. And that's true. Uh, actually, uh, of course, they weren't on video. They were filmed in film, but... Uh, the uh, concept of putting music on television and trying to promote the records uh, through television, uh, it was certainly one of the first times it was pulled off and probably the uh, up to MTV, the uh, most successful uh, venture so far. Um, the first uh, 
quote we're going to listen to here is uh, Peter Tork, and uh, I asked him whether he knew from the start uh, whether the monkeys was uh, going to blow up to be the thing that it was, and if he knew from the start also uh, what exactly the concept meant. Yeah, yeah. And did I know how big a success it was going to be? And the answer to that is yes, too, because uh, they told me that, you know, what the idea of it was, the concept was that if it, uh, you know, records, a TV show, concert performances, all of that, uh, you know, and uh, the goal was uh, was essentially what you saw. What happened was the goal. Nobody, uh, nobody was taken by surprise. I wasn't taken by surprise by the magnitude of the project. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, if it went at all, it was going to go that big. Now, as it turns out, there was problems figuring out whether it was going to go at all, but it wound up going. Though you've played at love and lost and sorrows turned your heart to frost, I will melt your heart again. Remember the feeling as a child when you woke up and morning smiled. This time you felt like you did then. There's just no percentage in remembering the past. It's time you learn to live again at last. Come with me, leave yesterday behind. And take a try and step outside your mind. Say for you there's no relief But I swear I'll prove you wrong Don't sit in your lonely room Just staring back in silent gloom That's not where you belong Come with me, I'll take you Where the taste of life is green Yes, every day holds wonders to be seen Don't touch the glass 
And that was She by the Monkees. Yeah, She was off the uh, second album. It's uh, a real headbanger tune, as you can tell. Uh, from the start, uh, the Monkees were, were really uh, always wrapped around in controversy. Uh, when it first started out, uh, people were calling them Beatle clones from the start. And uh, except for Bob Rafelson, who was one of the producers who uh, actually told me that he wasn't influenced by the Monkees, he came up with the idea about six or seven years before the Beatles. But um, anyway, uh, besides that, uh, a lot of D people were... Despite that, everybody else on the planet does seem to feel that the Monkees TV show copied the first two Beatle movies. Certainly, and uh, that's why there was a lot of industry uh, envy. Uh, many of the people who I interviewed uh, went on to tell me that uh, you know they, they thought that uh, if the Monkees hadn't come along, perhaps another group would have come along and um, done the same thing, uh, perhaps not with as much taste, but uh, someone else probably would have uh, put it together. And uh, I asked uh, Bert Schneider what the um, television network itself, NBC, thought from the start, and uh, this was his answer. I don't think anybody was really too thrilled about it. I mean, the network was never thrilled about it, except that it worked. Uh, you know, and who wants to fight? You know, no one's going to argue with that. And remember, the records, the records were coming out on RCA, which was, you know, another division. But, I mean, RCA and NBC were, you know, it's all one company. So the network had to deal with the fact that here was this, you know, was selling so many records that you know everybody understood that they should. It was, it was they, they were counting the money. Right. So you know. At that point, as long as someone doesn't do something really egregiously wrong, they just stayed away.
and that was I Want to Be Free by the Monkees. That was off their first album, and uh, actually that was a uh, bootleg version off the Monkey Shines bootleg, which is a little better than the uh, original version, which had Davy Jones and an acoustic guitar, and they showed him running along freely on the beach. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the Monkees were going to get the plastic label attached to them, since they were picked out of 437 people that tried out. You know, there's one thing I never understood, Eric. If they wanted people to play uh, the part of musicians in a TV show, why did they even worry about getting musicians in the first place? Actually, um, it was just coincidental that Jones and Dolans uh, had any musical talent whatsoever. Well, actually, of the four, Jones was the only one with any solo career to speak of prior to the Monkees in 1965. He had put out a solo album, which had done reasonably well. Yeah, it's funny that uh, it, it may not be coincidental at all that that was on the Columbia Screen Gems label. Um, that may have been his end to the Monkees. Uh, but uh, actually, they had all been involved with music. Torque was a folky who had been around Greenwich Village a lot. And Nesmith uh, was sort of a pseudo-Dylan imitator who was doing his thing. So they all had a little talent. Um, and I, I think they felt that that would help... Um, with the authenticity of it all. Um, unfortunately, Don Kirshner uh, kind of wiped that all out because as soon as the monkey started getting big, uh, he's very well known for his enormous ego, and uh, he started taking credit for it and going to the press and saying, well, I made this music and the monkeys didn't, uh, which was just what Rafelson and Schneider, the two producers, uh, that was their worst nightmare, was uh, that the fact that it would get out that the monkeys had not been making this music. They had just been doing the vocal tracks. It's interesting that Kirshner did that. I mean, you would think that was the last thing that they would want to get out. And, of course, Kirshner got paid pretty well for doing it, and they fired him shortly after that, didn't they? They did, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, right now there's a quote from Bob Rabelson, the uh, producer, who uh, talks about the uh, whole idea of letting the press uh, get a hold of the information that the monkeys weren't making the music. And protested. So how do you counteract with the press, okay? Well, it wasn't a question of doing it with the press. Once it got out, there was no way of stopping it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I couldn't then go to the monkeys and say, please, for God's sake, lie and tell them that you produced it on there. Because these guys didn't like them with that music. And they thought they could do a better job than Kirsten's book. They at least wanted to have a shot at it. Now remember, groups is a rule up until this time. It took years of consolidation on the streets. A bass player meets a drum player. They join one group. They pick up another guitarist. They move over to another group. They fire two guys and another one until finally it gets them just like with the Beatles. And it gets consolidated over a long period of time where a, a kind of harmonious sense of what the sound should be and could be is born of a lot of trial and error. And then afterwards, as you now know about the Beatles and God knows how many other groups, it wasn't all that harmonious in the group. Right. And a Brian Epstein was doing, in effect, what we were doing, but with a slight more laissez-faire attitude. Right. But uh, um, nonetheless, um, there was that kind of um, street trial. And these guys didn't have that opportunity. And so for them to find out what kind of music they wanted to create, and who was to be the boss, say, of the group? What was the sound to it? It was a bit of a jumble. And in that sense, Kirshner was right. I mean, there was a big argument about who was the lead singer, Davey or Mickey. Right. Uh, uh, now, I exercised the voice in all of this, but uh, it was really difficult to sort out because we were in such chaos. You know, uh, imagine shooting two songs a week. Hopefully, at one new one. A week, maybe. Right. I thought love was only true in fairy tales. And for someone else, but not for me. Our love was out to get me. That's the way it seemed. Disappointment haunted all my dreams Then I saw her face Now I'm a believer I her trace Put out in my mind I'm in love I'm a believer I couldn't leave her if I tried I thought love was more 
different thing Seems the more I gave, the less I got What's the use in trying When all you get is pain But When I needed sunshine, I got rain I saw her face Now I'm a believer Not afraid To doubt in my mind I'm in love I'm a believer I couldn't leave her if I tried Saw her face Now I'm a believer Not a trace Put out in my mind I'm in love I'm a believer I couldn't leave her If I tried Yes, I saw her face Now I'm a believer I'm a Believer, one of the Monkees' three number one hits in their short-lived career. Actually, that one was their biggest. It sold 10 million copies worldwide and uh, wow. rode the charts for about three and a half months. Um, Prefab or not, with 10 million in sales, I guess they did rival the Beatles, at least there. Yes, in fact, uh, their first album uh, was the largest debut-selling album um, in terms of uh, number one at the charts. It was the number one for 15 straight weeks. Um, that was just recently broken, unfortunately, by Men, Men at, work. at Work. Right. But uh, until then, they held that record. And, um, of course, Don Kirshner had a big hand in all of this. Uh, that's why they brought him into the project. He was well known at the time for being the man with the uh, golden ear, they said. Um, he wasn't the actual producer, though. On that track, uh, Jeff Berry was the producer who uh, also wrote uh, Sugar Sugar later with the Archies. Um, Kirshner was more the uh, overseer of the, the whole project, bringing in writers, um, Carol King and Neil Diamond, who obviously wrote that last track. And uh, he also brought in the studio musicians who uh, facetiously called themselves the uh, Candy Store Prophets. And uh, Glenn Campbell was, I, I think, uh, one of the session players uh, who was on a lot of these tracks. Um, of course, the uh, monkeys, especially Nesmith and Torque, were very upset about this because they uh, had seen themselves as putting their own music into the group. And uh, Kirshner was really only interested in having Davy Jones and uh, Mickey Dolan singing the lead tracks. And uh, I asked uh, Peter how he felt about um, Kirshner's involvement, and this is what he said. I had the... I had projected that I was going to be a musician in the band, and uh, when they started cranking up the records without me, I was disappointed. But I see now, as I look back, that that was critical, that, that that's the way it had to be. Uh, and uh, a lot of things that uh, bothered the, the Jesus out of me when I was in the group and shortly after I left it don't trouble me in the slightest anymore. Um, the business about the commercial, well, that business about the commercial. I was, I was mortified that the records were being made without me. I was humiliated and, and felt uh, shunned and slighted. And 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 uh, most, the worst thing was that nobody seemed to notice, you know. And I would scream and yell and rave and they'd scratch their heads and they'd look at me and they'd go, what is this? And, I'm, and I would tell them and they would say, no, no, no. No, no, you don't understand. You have no reason. It's, it's the same thing as like this Joan Jett thing. Absolute incomprehension, you know, the person himself does not understand his own experience, which is typical of a lot of what goes on today. The basic person's experience doesn't count. I, I, why are you going through this, Peter? You know, because I felt lied to and I felt humiliated. But you don't have any call to feel that way. Therefore, you know, your human feelings don't count. So 
But like I said, as I look back on it now, I see that uh, uh, by the terms of the project, in the project's own terms, that was the way it had to be. She knows her mind, all right, your Auntie Griselda. She says she knows my kind, she might maybe so. Oh, yeah, she's raised you right, your Auntie Griselda. You only know the things she wants you to know. I know she's having a fit. She doesn't like me a bit. No bird of grace ever lit on Auntie Griselda. You can't begrudge her style, your Auntie Griselda. She couldn't budge a smile and do it for free. To your Auntie Griselda Oh no, don't look at me like Auntie Griselda It takes much more to be someone of your own You've got to make it free from Auntie Griselda For just like her, you'll have to make it alone Me up that no bird of grace ever lit on Auntie Griselda. Auntie Griselda, Auntie Griselda. Mr. Davalina, Mr. Bob Davalina, Mr. Davalina, Mr. Bob Davalina. Zilch, China Clipper calling Alamita. China Clipper calling Alamita. Zilch, never mind the furthermore, the plea is self defense. Never mind the furthermore, the plea is self defense. Never mind the furthermore, the plea is self defense. It is of my opinion that the people are intending. It is of my opinion that the people are intending. It is of my opinion that the people are intending. It is of my opinion that the people are intending. It is of my opinion that the people are intending. It is of my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the people are intending. It is my opinion that the that was zilch, and uh, I think I'm having an acid flashback to when I was seven years old. And I yeah. bought the Headquarters album, which is the first album that um, the Monkees actually produced themselves and played on most of the tracks. They're not credited as the producer, right? They, there's a, a name on the album. Hold on. Let me take a look and see this wild name that's on here that they may have made up. Produced by Douglas Farthing Hat Hatfield. I think he must have been a real person because uh, he has a song that he wrote on that album. I'm not sure which track it is, hmm. but uh, who knows where he is now. Hopefully he's listening today if you are. Hello. Most likely he is. Yes. Um, at this point, uh, the, the Monkees could afford to actually make their own music, and uh, some people may have said that uh, their, mu their music took a dip after they got rid of uh, Kirshner, and uh, the sales certainly uh, may have proved that. The, their second album, More of the Monkeys, sold 5 million copies, and uh, Headquarters only sold uh, 2.5 million. So I guess uh, the word had gotten out at that point. Um, Headquarters was released during 1967, during the second year of the two years that the Monkey Show played on TV? No, not, this is probably towards the end of the first season and possibly during reruns or something. That was So it was 67 toward the end of the first season? Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, at this point... Uh, the monkeys, at least in their 
eight or nine months of existence. It put, uh, out, easily, put out three albums in that, three in albums that time? Wow. And, uh, and a single. And uh, certainly they had outsold all the competition and uh, the manufacturing and everything involved. They, they were planning a tour at this point. Um, it was quite a success. And uh, Bert Schneider told me, uh, one of the producers, Bert Schneider, told me that uh, at this point... Uh, the, the monkeys' egos uh, sort of exploded, and then it's easy to see why they were they were nobodies, and suddenly here they are, television stars being mobbed everywhere they go, and uh, so I, I talked to to Mr. Schneider and asked him uh, what he tried to do to uh, keep these guys in line and try to keep the press in line too, who was still the press was lambasting them every chance they got. Well, I would say that there was that. that at least insofar as I was concerned, I had a, a lot of desire to manage the, the, the way in which the press got a hold of them. You know, I, I, I was certainly aware that there was a balance, you know, there was like, it's like walking a tightrope all the time, you know, because on the one hand, we're, we want to encourage everybody to be as uh, creative, inventive, don't lose your personalities. That's why that's why you got the job to begin with. It's because of who you are, so don't back off of that. And at the same time, try and keep something manageable that doesn't end up with a phone call that says you're canceled. All right? So there's, you know, you're walking that line. You've got, you know, uh, industrial America on the one hand and rebellion on the other. And, you know, and we, what we stand for is is the rebellion, or what the show does, and and what we do. But at the same time, we're dealing within the real world. So I I was I was very personally desirous of, of manipulating the situation so that we wouldn't get our heads chopped off. And I put a lot of pressure on on the guys to be very careful. And it, you know there was there were lines not to go past. Mm -hmm. and eventually, uh, those barriers started to come down. Or yeah, yeah, sure. The, yeah, the more solidly successful they became, the uh, the safer it was to be more uh, what would seem to be more outrageous in terms of attitudes. And uh, yeah, I mean, sure, Peter. Uh, I think Peter felt that. Most in, in, in politics, Peter felt that much more strongly than anyone else because he really was the first of the four to manifest any attitude about being against the war. But uh, he wasn't very far ahead of anybody. She won't come and lose my mind It's too easy humming songs To a girl in yellow dress It's been a long time since the party And the room is in a mess Before King Serena Miles Sitting stately on the floor There are birds out on the sidewalk And a ballet at the door He reminds me of a penguin With few and plaster hair There's Calvin Carter on the letter And the birds
That was the shortest rock star of all time, Davy Jones, doing She Hangs Out. And uh, She Hangs Out is the song that uh, finally got Don Kirshner sacked from the Monkees Project. Um, they were recording the um, A Little Bit Me, A Little Bit You single. And at this time, the tensions had been building uh, between uh, Nesmith and Torque and uh, Kirshner. And Kirshner just had Dolans and Jones come in to do this track, uh, She Hangs Out. And uh, somehow that ended up on the B-side of the single. And uh, everything erupted at, at that point. And uh, everyone gathered together, the four monkeys, Kirshner and the two producers, uh, Ravelson and Schneider. And they had a, a meeting about uh, who was going to take control of the music at this uh, point. And... Um, Apparently, also some rate, uh, record company executives were at this meeting, and um, they said that there was no way the Monkees were going to do their own music. Uh, at this point, uh, Mike Nesmith put his hand through the wall and said, uh, that could have been your face, to uh, one of the Screen Gems executives, and stormed out. And uh, Bert Schneider decided to go with the Monkees, to go with Nesmith and Tork, and let them do their own music. And uh, Don Kirshner disappeared... Uh, only to come back and do uh, the great Sugar Sugar a few years later. Uh, I asked Peter how he felt uh, about this whole controversy and whether it uh, caused a, a rift between the band, since Nesmith and Torque were the uh, two members who were most upset about not making the music. And this is what he said. Uh, it didn't cause a rift, in the sense that uh, when the time came, Bert asked all of us if we wanted to make our record, we all four said yes. And that's why Bert went ahead and made the changes and the plans and why he suffered the, pro the, the business. You know, I mean, another guy would have, this is what I like Bert for, another guy would have said, I can't let you do it, boys. Uh, uh, Kirshner would sue us and we, you know, would take us to court. And we would, but Bert doesn't mind a fight, uh, particularly a lot. He just, he, if, you know, he won't be threatened, he won't be bludgeoned. And if he wants to do it, he will go ahead and do it. And he wanted us to want to do this. This is what I, this is what I love Bert for. And, uh, he wanted us to want to do it, and uh, while he wouldn't goad us, uh, he uh, he certainly didn't deny us the uh, the uh, the effort. Um, when we wanted to do it, uh, um, he went ahead and arranged that it be done, and uh, it it just absolutely blew Kirshner out of the water. Yeah. Um, Kirshner thereupon uh, left the Monkees and took up a project that was somewhat less threatening. The Monkees being not plastic enough for Don Kirshner, he subsequently went sure. straight to the Archies, who were not going to give him any S dash dash dash, as you will print, if you print this at all. Now, you look back on it and you say, you know, um, the commercial aspects don't bother you as much. When looking back on Kirshner, how do you feel about him? <laughs> and Kirshner was Kirshner. I have nothing to say for or against him. Uh, he, uh, he, was, uh, he definitely had his time, and for a time he was probably the best moneymaker. I mean, he probably was. He probably holds the record 
for as being the best, best money maker over the longest period for a long, long time in terms of just being able to say, that'll sell, that won't, that'll sell, that won't. Uh, the only, uh, what Donnie didn't know was that, uh, was that if we, if he could have gone right on being the same guy he was, doing the same things he did, having the same guys be our producer, all we wanted to do was be the musicians in the chairs. And if he had been willing to put up with us being the musicians in the chairs, he could have gone right on being the monkey's uh, musical overseer, you know, forever and ever. But for some reason, and I don't to this date know why exactly, but for some reason he saw that, you know, obviously it was a challenge because if he, once he says no and we say yes, then it's a challenge. But before that point, why he had to say no and insist that it be a challenge is something I don't understand because uh, Donnie could right have gone right on being the, the monkey's guy forever, you know, as long as there was a monkey's project. But for some reason, the fact that we wanted to be in the chairs was so threatening to him that he uh, absolutely refused to allow it to happen. It was going to be, you know, over his dead body. And while it didn't quite come to that, uh, it certainly did uh, uh, wind up in his uh, dissociating from the Columbia Screen Gems project. Was there a scene or something where Nesmith put his fist to the wall? Yes, there was. Yes, there was. But uh, I don't remember too much about that scene. <laughs> Today because the roses are in blue 
That's Pleasant Valley Sunday by the Monkees. Uh, that was off their fourth album, Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones Limited, considered by many monkey aficionados as their best album. And uh, that song was a hit during the summer of 67, the wonderful summer of 67. And as you can tell, uh, the Monkees are maturing at this point. Uh, uh, Nesmith was playing guitar on that track. Uh, Torque was uh, playing... Uh, he was on the piano track, and uh, their voices are all over the place, and they even had feedback at the end. I mean, they were with it now. Unfortunately, older kids, on the other hand, <laughs> didn't consider them with it, and uh, this is where the monkeys were getting in trouble. They they were really um, worried that uh, about what the older kids thought about them. Uh, the monkeys just weren't cool enough for, for the kids who were tuning in and dropping out and all that. So uh, that um, caused the monkeys to start worrying about uh, what they should be doing with their fame and fortune. And uh, I uh, talked to Bob Rapleson about this, and uh, here's what he said about what was going on at this point in the monkeys' career. Furthermore, there was the tremendous disillusion of now that the word had gotten out that the monkeys were not responsible. The their music. The older kids said, fuck the monkeys, let my little sister watch them. Uh, but I want to listen to Jim Mark. Uh, I want to listen to the Stone. I want to listen to the Weather. Not Aristotle Monkey Weather. Uh, and I think that they took that to task. You know, they, 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 they know that. They were tired of being bubblegum. They weren't bubblegum types as individuals, uh, whatever you might think of them, uh, each one of these guys has managed in their own right, although I'm not up to date on all of them, to sustain pretty interesting lines. Uh, and if you look at their contemporaries in music, you find out where they are. So there was a lot of uh, fighting uh, about this issue of bubblegum. Could hide neath the wings of the bluebird as she sings. The six o'clock alarm would never ring. But it rings and I rise, wipe the sleep out of my eyes. My shaven razor's cold and it sings.
took me as a white knight on his steed. Now you know how happy I can be. Oh, and our good time starts and ends without our love one to spend. But how much, baby, do we really Listening to KALX, University of California Radio in Berkeley. And if you've been listening for a while, you've noticed that we've had a special on the monkeys, and the voice that's done most of the talking is journalist named Eric Lefkowitz, whose article on the monkeys you may have read in the May 4th issue of BAM magazine. And that last song we heard by the monkeys, Daydream Believer, was the Beatles, I mean, <laughs> the monkeys' fifth single. And uh, their final mega hit, as I would describe it. And they had uh, three number ones, and that was the last one. And I, I think they had one hit afterwards with Valerie, top five. Well, that but... was a big hit, but I mean, Daydream Believer sold zillions. Yeah, yeah. In fact, their first five singles all did. Um, at this point, the uh, the show was going off the air, so it was significant. They had this one last shot in the arm. Uh, after two seasons and 56 episodes, uh, they decided to call it quits, or they were canceled uh, uh, Schneider told me they put him up against uh, Gunsmoke the, uh, the second season. So their ratings were down, but uh, they weren't low enough to actually cancel the show. One interesting thing that we haven't mentioned is that during the two years that the show aired on NBC, a lot of cities never saw it or only saw either the first year or the second year because it was during the Vietnam War, and the show was considered kind of anti-establishment, and there were a lot of stations that were afraid to carry the monkey, so there were some cities where it wasn't seen until 15 years later in reruns. Yeah, you may not remember at the time, if you were watching it and you were young, uh, that there were these political jokes, but uh, I got up early at, and watched the show recently on Channel 44. It's on at 6 in the morning, and I was watching an episode, and uh, there was a scene when they were uh, all playing uh, dominoes, and uh, Mickey pushes a domino down and all these dominoes fall and he goes peter turns to uh mike and says what's this and mike goes southeast asia so they had their little uh, political jokes uh that were that were in there um and really at this point uh towards the second season uh they they were getting a little looser uh they were pretty uh, satiated with their fame uh they cut the laugh track off the uh, show in the second season and uh Mickey Dolan's um, uh, directed one of the shows, and they had Frank Zappa on a show, and uh, they were getting pretty wild. So uh, it was pretty obvious the show was going to wind down, and they finally decided to uh, to call it quits. And it, uh, it was certainly the most free, by far, the most freeform show on television at the time. It was real daring in that respect for commercial television. Still would be if it was on today. Um, why was it canceled? Whose decision was it? 
Rabelson and Schneider um, told me recently when I interviewed them um, that actually they decided to take the show off the air because they felt they had done it all, that they were running dry at that point, and there really wasn't uh, much else to do with it. And they figured the uh, band would go on touring and making specials. And uh, actually, that's why they made the movie Head, which uh, we'll hear uh, Rafelson talk about in a second. Um, it was sort of uh, an end project to uh, sum up the monkeys, and it was radically different. If anyone's seen it, they know it's radically different than the um, than the show itself. It was uh, co-written by Jack Nicholson uh, with Bob Rafelson, and uh, Jack Nicholson wasn't famous at the time, was he? He was sort of unknown, wasn't he? Um, yeah, he was uh, fairly unknown. Uh, in fact, uh, his connection with Rafelson uh, really uh, worked out because uh, Rafelson and Schneider went on to form BBS Productions after The Monkees. Uh, their first movie was Head, and their second movie was Easy Rider. And uh, Rafelson himself went on to direct... Uh, Five Easy Pieces. Right. With which, Nicholson, was a smash in that. So uh, that certainly helped out. And P- uh, Peter Tork... Uh, said in his interview that uh, if it hadn't been for Jack Nicholson on the set of Head, everything uh, would have just blown up at that point, because they were all really going in their uh, separate directions. But um, I asked Ravelson about the movie Head, and uh, he's very proud of it, as are are all the uh, monkeys. Um, And uh, he talked about how at the time when uh, Head came out, uh, the monkeys weren't really popular um, at all with the public, and... uh, this is what he has to say about Head. In fact, when the theater opened the first night down in the village, people came storming now and demanded their money back because they found out the monkeys were infected. So, in fact, what I felt about the movie was let this movie be our just reward for having done anything else. If we find an audience, let it be an audience that might appreciate a more sophisticated understanding of rock and roll and what we had all been through. And I had no idea it was blocked, but I certainly knew that it was not going to be let's clamor for the monkeys and bring seven-year-olds because you don't have them starting off committing suicide in the movie if that's what you want to accomplish. The movie separates itself entirely, stylistically, from uh, the television show. And Bert kept saying, look, all your life you've talked about wanting to make a movie, but God's sake, why do you want to make the monkey movie?
And that was the Porpoise Song, which is the main theme song of the movie Head. And uh, after Head, the uh, last uh, act of the monkeys was to make a special uh, 33rd, 33 and a third revolutions per monkey, which was um, an hour-long special they made, which unfortunately NBC put up against the Oscars. They also never repeated the show. Never. In Despite fact, the excellence of one of the best rock shows that's ever been broadcast on television, they had on Julie Driscoll, Brian Auger, and the Trinity, who were phenomenal and really hot in England at that time. Peter Pork, Peter Tork did a thing where he played uh, an instrument that was kind of weird, uh, sort of a synthesizer-type instrument. He did an instrumental solo on it, and it was very impressive. It, it was really a terrific show, and it never ran again. Yeah, Peter quit right after that, uh, and... Uh, he had a little trouble after this. Uh, he was he was pretty burnt out at this time. He was hanging out a lot with uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, matter of fact, we forgot to mention that uh, Jimi Hendrix's uh, first tour of the United States was uh, opening up for the Monkees. And getting booed off the stage by little teeny boppers. Although Mickey Dolenz, I, I asked him about the incident. I don't know if he, uh, if he remembers it well or not, but he seemed to um, say that uh, Hendrix was well received, uh, but he got a hit record off the tour. And they decided uh, to let him go and tour on his own at that point. Uh, At least that's what Mickey Dolenz has to say about it. But uh, the the special was the last thing uh, that the monkey, all four monkeys did together. Um, The three monkeys carried on for a while. uh, They made a few albums, uh, none of which I've even listened to. I don't know why. I just never bothered with it. Uh, I guess there were a few good songs after that. Well, Mike Nesmith was uh, the only one who had success as a singer-songwriter after that. Of course, he wrote Different Drum for the Stone Ponies, a group that featured Linda Ronstadt on lead vocals. And the following year, 1968, he had uh, a hit with a band called the uh, First National... What was the name of that band? First National Band, I think. And uh, the song was called Joanne, country tune, and he, he did real well with that. I think it was about a top 20 hit. And um, gradually, like, uh, they they just faded out, and uh, there was really nothing left of them. And in the early 70s, it wasn't um, wasn't very hip to, to like the monkeys anymore. I think during the 70s, uh, Jones and Dolans got together with their pr- uh, primary songwriters, Boyce and Hart, who wrote the theme from the monkeys and last train to Clarksville, and did a tour sort of as a monkeys reunion without uh, Michael and Peter. Yeah, they uh, toured American theme parks, uh, Great America, and uh, sort of like that movie Spinal Tap, if you've all seen that. Um, they carried on for a while, and uh, but interestingly enough, um, there have been revivals of the monkeys, uh, one in England and one in Japan. Um, these were in the late 70s and the early 80s, and they've been fairly massive revivals, though. The records have gone top 10, and... Uh, Peter Tork and Davy Jones separately have gone over and, and toured uh, Japan. And I asked Peter, why, why does he um, think that uh, the monkeys carries on and, and why people think so finely back on the show? The reason that the monkeys meant so much to so many people, I think, is because without threatening them, there seemed to be an element of, of, uh, of this is the way things could be. Uh, it's a phony in that part of the implication is this is the way it could be except for real life but at the same time there there is this this offer that people can get together and and, you know it was part of the 60s all you need is love kind of notion and I think that uh, I mean every era you know some people are still stuck in the 30s right and there's going to be people stuck in the 60s for the rest of their lives Bert put it pretty well I thought he said that um Instead of following those deaths, the kids know best. The kids know best. Yes, sir. Don't you know? 